Welcome to Contemporary Philosophy. My name is Mark Dorsby. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at the introduction to Edmund Husserl's seminal text, The Logical Investigations. Uh, welcome back, everyone. If you've been watching the video series, then you know that in our last video, we took a look at the work of an important uh, logician and potential, or what he's often called the father of analytic philosophy, Gottlob Frege. In particular, we looked at his argument, his discussion regarding the role of logic and philosophy and truth, as well as his famous discussion in the sense of reference, in his essay Sense and Reference. Um, today, what we're going to be looking at is a philosopher who lived at the same time as Frege. In fact, Frege and Husserl were in communication with each other, uh, and they're both writing about logic, but we'll see from distinctly different perspectives. And while Frege ultimately helped um, establish quantificational first-order logic um, and was absolutely essential in terms of the contemporary era's emphasis on the role of language and meaning, in philosoph for philosophical problems. Edmund Husserl is also a seminal thinker, and he becomes the father of what's known as phenomenology, or the founder of phenomenology, which will, lay, which will become um, the methodology for a lot of continental philosophy, in particular from the, in the work of existentialists such as Martin Heidegger um, and Jean-Paul Sartre. So let's jump in here and take a look at Edmund Husserl's text. <coughs> now, uh, forgive me. Uh, what we're going to start off with here is here's a picture of Edmund Husserl. Uh, he lived from 1859 to 1938. Uh, he's frequently known as the father of the founder of phenomenology. And for Husserl, phenomenology was its own new type of scientific philosophical discipline. Uh, this video is not really going to focus on phenomenology. It's really going to focus on his most his earliest and probably most seminal work, The Logical Investigations. Now, there are three... Uh, volumes of the logical investigations, we're only going to be taking a look at excerpts from the very first two chapters of the first of those of those texts. Um, so we're looking at logical investigations one. Um, other key texts in his corpus include the ideas pertaining to a pure phenomenology and to a phenomenological philosophy, also known as ideas one. There's also an ideas two um, as well, uh, as well as an ideas three. There's also the Crisis of the European Sciences, which is a very, very famous of his essay of his. And, uh, and at the end of his life, Husserl actually writes a text which is called the Cartesian Meditations, which is quite helpful in terms of understanding Husserl's later development and later work. If you're interested in the work of Husserl, take a look at the Husserliana, which is the name of the collection of all of Husserl's complete writings. Most of them actually have not been translated into English, but mo all of the seminal and really important texts have been. Um, and I believe that's published by Singer. There's a lot we could potentially say about Edmund Husserl's personal biography, but in order to jump right into it, I'm gonna dispense with the personal biography and really talk a little bit about what's going on in this text and how it can, how this text in particular can be understood as an introduction to phenomenology. And again, if you're interested in phenomenology, take a look at my other video series. I have an entire course on phenomenology, which really um, looks in a lot of detail at Husserl's text ideas one. Um, so take a look at that. Phenomenology you might say is the study of that which must ne is the study of what must necessarily be the case, such that phenomena are experienced the way they are. Now, uh, the logical investigations really is not a text that's seeking to articulate a new science as such. Rather, the logical investigations is seeking to articulate the foundations and or um, the, log the grounds upon which logic as a science itself is built. Uh, to keep in mind here, like Frege, uh, Husserl actually began his first studies, his early studies, is in mathematics. And so he's actually a mathematician, and he's interested in defending the objectivity of logic, but he does so from a very different perspective than we see that Frege that we saw in Frege. Now, in these early discussions, what we're going to really look at today is what we might call the problem of psychologism. Now, psychologism would be the idea that um, really stands here as a position that logic, the foundation of logic, is ultimately rooted in the psychological mechanisms that allow the mental states in which logical formations can arise. So psychologism is one uh, way of viewing logic and viewing language 
uh, and that is the objectivity of logic. If you think of logic as a science for the validity of arguments, then psychologism would be the view that the validity of argumentation is ultimately rooted in certain psychological laws uh, that govern the types of mental states which are possible for human beings. There's lots of things we'll say about psychologism today, but one thing you can see from the very get-go is that psychologism, if it's true, um, in terms of logic, would mean that if the laws of logic are grounded in the laws of psychology, then ultimately logic's objectivity is rooted in the subjectivity of mental phenomena um, and in the, the causal processes which allow mental phenomena to occur as they do. This is not necessarily a problem for, many, for some logicians. For Husserl, it certainly was a problem. And I also think, at least from my reading, that Frege is equally worried about the threat that psychologism can pose to the objectivity of logic. Now, why do we care about the objectivity of logic? Ultimately, it's because logic governs the formation for how we can understand the meaning of our language in ways which is rigorous um, and sound. So if philosophy is going to articulate problems about the objectivity of the world, then it really then the question about the foundation of logic is absolutely essential to understanding how the process of meaning can unfold. Now let's sort of just start here with the introduction and we're going to trace through just a couple of the chapters in a couple of the first sections from um, the logical investigations. And it begins with this question, well, what exactly is logic? And let me also say, before, as I, before I get going here, that this is one of the best texts that, in my opinion, that Husserl ever wrote. It's one of the most, it's certainly, in my view, the, be, the most well-written of his text. Um, it's quite clear and quite direct. I mean, he was highly praised, at least for the first logical investigations. If you're interested in studying more about uh, the relationship between Husserl and Frege, I encourage you to take a look at the correspondence between the two. Then in particular, there's a critique of Husserl's logical investigations by Frege. And so we could look at that and we would probably gain a lot of interesting insight regarding how we can juxtapose these two different philosophers with regard to their importance for the development of contemporary 20th and 21st century philosophy. So let's get back to the heart of it here. What exactly is logic? Well, the first section here, Husserl titles The Controversy Regarding the Definition of Logic and the Essential Contents of Its Doctrine. So what exactly is the definition of logic? Well, Husserl immediately quotes John Stuart Mill, who during the 19th century, and to be clear, Husserl is writing this text at the end of the 19th, at the end of the 19th century and in the early part of the 20th century. So in the mid uh, 19th century, John Stuart Mill offers a position regarding what logic is in his book on logic. Um, and I've pulled just a little excerpt here um, from section two of that work where John Stuart Mill says that logic has often been called the art of reasoning. And a writer who has done more than any person to restore this study to the rank from which it had fallen in the estimation of the cultivated class in our own country has adopted the above de definition with an amendment. He's defined logic to be a science as well as the art of reasoning, meaning by the former term, the analysis of the mental process which takes place whenever we reason, and by the latter, the rules grounded on that analysis for conducting the process correctly. And this, Husserl actually refers to John Stuart Mill's section one, but I pulled this definition because we're going to see that Husserl's discussion of psychologism really grows out of this, this uh, distinction in this position that John Stuart Mill is articulating. And you can see here is that John Stuart Mill says that on the one hand, logic is concerned with these mental processes. And on the other hand, logic is concerned with the, 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 the rules which ground the use of logic for reasoning correctly. So you have sort of two different positions that go together. John Stuart Mill ultimately takes the position of psychologism. And this is sort of one of the three camps that Husserl is going to discuss. Now, in this first introduction, Husserl really only talks about the psychological, so we're really only going to focus on those. But there are other camps. In particular, Husserl's own camp is outside of the psycho psychologistic camp. Uh, another thing here I forgot to mention is that Husserl is heavily indebted with regard to his own philosophy, his phenomenology, and ultimately his understanding of 
of psychology uh, by his work uh, under the thinker Franz Brentano. So if you want to develop or, or engage in a more systematic study of Husserl's work, I would highly encourage you to take a look at the work of Franz Brentano and then be able to, so that way you can begin to compare where Husserl's working from with regard to where he's going. So, but John Stuart Mill is a psychologist, he's not a psychologist, but he takes the psychological view, which is namely that logic on the one hand is about how these mental processes occur, which is really the purview of psychology. Now, section two concerns the necessity for a renewed discussion regarding the questions of principle. Now, uh, in particular, Husserl mentions Mill and Trendelberg um, in terms of their dominance within the 19th century, the latter half of the 19th century, and how their position has come to um, dominate the view of logic when Husserl is writing. Um, I would say today, and I have to be frank, I'm not a logician, um, so that's not my area of specialization. But from what I can gather, I don't believe on I I don't believe that logicians uh, take the psychologistic view um, in the way in which we saw that they did in the latter half of the 19th century. So, there you should recognize that when Husserl is writing the logical investigations, I think he's writing for a different audience potentially than the most contemporary audience we might have today. Uh, but anyway, let's, there certainly are still many, many people who hold uh, the view of psychologism. But he thinks here that Mill and Trendelberg seem to be part of the two of the key historical figures which have really prepare, uh, propelled the psychologistic framework forward. But, of course, for Husserl, the question is, well, how exactly are we going to define logic anew? How can we figure out what logic is uh, and begin again, as it were, so that way we know for certain that we have a sure foundation for how we understand logic. Because remember, logic undergirds all the sciences. And so this raises a question, well, if we're going to understand what logic is and try to define what logic is, we have to understand whether or not it's a science and what kind of science it might be. So that means that we have to begin to think about what scientific study itself is. Keep in mind here that when we talk about science, we're not merely talking about physical science. Most people, when I, may, when I would talk about, if I talk about science, are going to think about Isaac Newton, for instance. If you think about material physics, um, other people might think about chemistry, or people might think about biology. But the key here is to think about science in the most uh, generalistic sense. What is a science? Well, the first thing we can know is that a science is always going to be given by its field of study. So for instance, physics is concerned with the natural movement of bodies in space, right? Chemistry is concerned with the way in which chemicals uh, can be intermingled and what their relations are. Astrophysics is a science which studies, or cosmology is a science which studies uh, the movement of heavenly bodies. Mathematics is a science which studies, I suppose, uh, the patterns within uh, quantities uh, that could be given quantitatively. I, I'm not going to hold, don't hold me to that sort of definition of mathematics as a science, but how does Husserl suggest it? Well, he says that the definitions of a science are, tend to mirror the stages of that science's development. So the knowledge of the conceptual character of a science's objects and of the boundaries and the place of its field follow the science and progress with it. So it's interesting here that when we take a science, a particular scientific study, and mathematics here is probably the oldest of human sciences that have ever existed, um, and you can compare science with physics, and one of the things we can notice is that as a science develops, we tend to gain a more rigorous definition about what that science is really about, or what the definition of a science might be. So the stages for the development of science are instructive in terms of us understanding what the de definition of a science might be. And it's always related to the object of that science. Now, there is a problem of what Husserl calls inadequate demarcation. Or in other words, the technical term used here is field delimitation. And that is this, which it seems to be that science, it, that when a science is developing, there may not be an adequate demarcation to know what the field of a science might be. Take, for instance, here that 
all of the sciences, except for maybe with math, with the exception of mathematics, seem to have first developed out of philosophical this out of a philosophical discipline. So as physics developed, um, it develops out of different things, and as it goes forward, it seems to increase in terms of its field delimitation. We begin to understand what the limit of that science is so that we can demarcate it from the other sciences. Notice that if you go back and take a look at Isaac Newton's very first work, he calls it a philosophy, a natural philosophy, rather than a science. Uh, and so th that, that is sort of just maybe a nomenclature issue. But what we can see here is that sciences sort of come and develop, new sciences develop when new demarcations become possible, or in other words, when new um, aims or goals can come into view. Now, the problem of inadequate demarcation is that what this means is that we can have invalid aims. So we can, we can think we're uh, studying a science, but we're actually studying something else. And so we have an invalidity in terms of the aim of the science we're using. Another possibility is that we might actually use the wrong methods in principle for that specific science. And then finally, we can also begin to confound the various logical levels that are related within that framework of the science. Husserl gives the example of Kant here, who says that, quote, we do not augment, but rather subvert the sciences if we allow their boundaries to run together. So it's very important that we, we develop some sort of means by which we can demarcate the different sciences. So if logic is going to be a science, we need to understand how, what it's not a science of, so that way we can understand what it is a science of. Uh, we have to be able to delimit and demarcate it. Now, there are a variety of disputed questions, and so Husserl wants to begin to organize for us the central path that he's going to follow within the logical investigations. And what we can do is we can summarize this path uh, by looking at four specific questions with regard to logic. One of them here is, is logic a theoretical or practical discipline? Right, a theoretical discipline is one which seeks, I suppose, to give some sort of theoretical explanation of things. Whereas a practical discipline would be some sort of discipline that aims to uh, provide uh, the correct means for the practicing of something, or the correct means of argumentation, I suppose. So we can ask ourselves, if logic is a science, is it a theoretical science, or is it like a technology? Is it a practical discipline for learning how to argue correctly and validly. Number two, is it independent of other sciences, and in particular of psychology and metaphysics? This is a very important question, because notice here that all of the sciences make arguments, and so that means that all of the sciences are utilizing the very principles that logic studies. But does that mean that logic is a part of those other sciences, or is it separate from them? And in particular, is it separate from psychology? Uh, which studies the causal operations for the mental states which can be derived in subjective awareness. Or, and the other question here is, is logic also, uh, is it separate from metaphysics? Now here, metaphysics studies the principles upon which physical reality might be based. One of the things here we notice is that if logic is concerned with truth, remember, take a look at um, our video last week, we saw that Frege argued very persuasively that logic is ultimately concerned with the truth of things. Well, if logic is concerned with the truth of things, and truth is given existentially, uh, then, and that's a debatable premise, I suppose, uh, the, the we could say is that metaphysics says the principles upon which truth can be organized in the world. So does that mean that logic is really a brand of metaphysics, or is it something different? Third, is logic a formal discipline? Um, you may have seen, if you, if you take a look at my YouTube channel, I have a whole video series that introduces students to logic as the formal discipline. Uh, it's an introduction to the formal logic course. So we can ask here, is logic a formal discipline? We certainly know that it does have a formal character, uh, but has it merely to do as usually conceived with the form of knowledge? Or should logic also take account of its matter? So a helpful distinction here would be to to distinguish the form of our arguments from the content of our arguments. Now we know that logic does concern the form of our content, of our arguments, and the form of the types of knowledge we think we can hold or have, but is logic concerned with the content of what we're arguing as well? And what does that mean exactly? This is a very important question, particularly 
if we're going to get some sort of handle on the psychologistic uh, dimension of the problem here. Um, so we'll see who's going to come back to that here in a little bit. Um, number four, has, has logic the character of an a priori, a de demonstrative discipline, or of an empirical inductive one? So quickly, what does a priori mean? A priori typically is translated from the Latin as meaning before experience. Um, I think the way we can understand it is something is a priori if it is foundational and comes before something else. Uh, so for instance, time and space are a priori conditions for my experience. I don't experience space, uh, space or time as such, I rather experience the world as given in space and in time, which means that space and time are a priori conditions. They're conditions that are necessary before I ever experience anything in the world. So we can ask this question, is logic the study of some sort of a priori dimension? That is, is logic a demonstrative discipline or is logic some have to do with the way in which the world is given in our experience? That is, is logic an empirical and therefore an inductive and probabilistic discipline? Uh, a good way to sort of distinguish this is take mathematics. We could say that mathematics, uh, and I don't want to get into the nuances of how you can apply the concept of a priori here, but what we can say is that you can do mathematics without actually measuring things in the world, right? You could do trigonometry without actually, you know, being on a ship trying to figure out where the lighthouse is. So, uh, and that's because mathematics does not require our experience in order to conduct the proofs in mathematics. So mathematics has an a priori character. It's not reliant upon our experience of the world. And it, it also, something is, if something is a priori, it is deductive and necessary, right? There's a sort of, there's two forms of reasoning. There is reasoning by deduction, which is reasoning by necessity. And there's reasoning by induction, which is reasoning by probability. All empirical experience is inductive because, because one doesn't learn from their experience how things necessarily must be or come about. One rather learns through repetition and then predicts according to that repetition, which is about probability. So you have a question here, is, is logic a priori or is it inductive? Uh, we're going to see here that he's going to argue it's a priori, uh, which is probably not a surprise uh, if you sort of, if you're familiar with this stuff at all. So it looks like from Husserl's perspective, we really have sort of two different choices. Either logic is going to be some sort of theoretical and formal discipline, or it's going to be psychological and empirical. Now, um, ultimately, what we're going to see is that Husserl is going to reject that latter option and rather argue in favor of the, the former option. He thinks it's a theoretical and a formal discipline, um, and he actually wants to protect it from psychologism. Now, he gives us a clue here at the end of the section with regard to what the final outcome of his investigation will be. He says, quote, the outcome of our investigation of this point will be the delineation of a new purely theoretical science, the all-important foundation for any technology of scientific knowledge and itself having the character of an a priori purely demonstrative science. Now, this is the science intended by Kant and the other proponents of formal or pure logic, but not rightly conceived and defined by them as regards its content and scope. So let's stop there. He's mentioning Immanuel Kant, who is a very, very important thinker in the history of philosophy, probably the preeminent uh, Enlightenment philosopher um, within the Western world, I think, um, in his critique of pure reason, as well as his discussion of what logic is and the transcendental or metaphysical conditions upon which reasoning must itself operate. Now, that means that Husserl sees his own work here as really in line and, in, and as being consistent with the work of Kant. But he doesn't think that Kant ultimately was 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 able to rightly identify the content and the scope of logic and in terms of its a priori character. He continues, the final outcome of these discussions is a clearly circumscribed idea of the disputed discipline's essential content, through which a clear position in regard to the previous mentioned controversies will have been gained. So 
Husserl has a really radical view here, uh, or a radical aim, and that is he thinks that what he's doing in logical investigations will ultimately be to really correct Kant and be able to demonstrate that logic is an a priori demonstrative science and that it is not a psychologistic type of science. Okay, let me take a drink of my coffee here. So let's start here with chapter one. And the name of this chapter is Logic as a Normative and in particular as a Practical Discipline. Now the first thing here to recognize is that he's going to think of logic and argue that logic is normative. And we'll explain what that means here in a moment. Um, but it also, it's not only normative, or rather insofar as logic is normative, it serves as a practical discipline. So for instance, if you take an introduction to logic course, what you're probably going to end up doing is get the, your professor will probably give you arguments that you will assess in terms of the premises and the conclusions. Maybe you'll uh, write them out in their symbolic notation, whether it's quantificational logic or categorical logic or something like this. And then you'll, you'll analyze them accordingly. And we, and we frequently um, tell our students that logic does have a practical import. Um, so there's this interesting question here. Is logic merely about uh, the rules that should guide us in terms of our practice of reasoning? And Husserl's not exactly going to deny that, but he certainly doesn't think that's the whole story. So section four here concerns the theoretical incompleteness of the separate scientists. Now, Husserl starts off with the artist, and he gives this example. He says, imagine an artist. Now, when we, when we uh, imagine a great artist, a, a painter, right? Imagine Picasso, for instance. Now, if we're going to judge the artwork of, uh, if we're gonna judge the artwork of Picasso or of a great artist, our judgments will be based upon various standards related to the craft, right? So for instance, if we see, um, Ask yourself, what makes a good painter, when you see a painting, a good painting versus a bad painting, how are you supposed to judge that? Well, if you take a look at, um, for instance, the work of fine arts appreciation um, in aesthetic thinkers, what you'll see is that our judgments are based upon how we understand the standards of that craft. So if you're looking at abstract art, there's gonna be sort of a different set of standards you're gonna apply than if, you, if you're looking at realistic artwork or photography or sculpture or something like this. So in other words, the judgments we make about art are, are concerned with whether or not the artist is following the principles um, that are implicit to the type of art they're doing. Um, so if you've ever taken an art class, what, an, what, an, what they'll teach you is some of the basic techniques you need to know in order to cultivate your craft. So when we judge artwork, we're really judging whether or not the artist follows the basic principles for the technique of that art craft. Now, the problem here is, though, that's about when we judge an art or judge an artwork. The practicing artist, by contrast, usually cannot really tell us what those principles are or explain to us how they're using those principles in their artwork. So notice here that there's always seems to be a division between the standards of judgment we apply to the artist versus the way in which the artist themselves understands their work in a practicing manner um, at, or in terms of it being a practice. Now, what Husserl says, though, is that this is not the, this is the case not just for um, the fine arts, but really for all of the arts, right? Uh, he says it's also true that the practicing scientist or mathematician, whoop, that's a little hard to see. He says it's also true that the practicing scientist or mathematician actually doesn't even have to offer an account of their principles while they're practicing mathematics. Um, one of the things, a friend of mine, a good, really good friend of mine, he's a mathematician. I mean, he's the chair of a, a, of a he's the chair of a mathematics department at a university, um, and one of the things he t we frequently talk about is the idea that most mathematics courses don't teach mathematics don't teach pure mathematics to students. Most students, when they take an algebra course or even a, 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 a linear algebra course or a calculus course or something, they're really being taught how to calculate things, right? how to practice the art of mathematics or the, the science of mathematics. But what they're not usually taught is what the principles are that underlie or form the foundation for the type of mathematical reasoning we do. 
For instance, most people know that mathematics deals with quantities, right? So you're so when you say two plus four, and this is a really simple example, two plus four equals six. What I've done there is I've um, added two quantities together. I've summed two quantities together. But how often have you taken a mathematics course where they begin to lay out what a quantity itself is? And the answer is probably never, right? I certainly know that I've never taken a mathematics class that began by, by defining what exactly a number is, uh, not in any sort of rigorous sense. So you can see here that even a mathematician can utilize, can do their, their scientific craft without necessarily um, having an overt reference to the principles that underlie mathematics. So for Husserl, this means that this sort of interesting distinction he draws out between the judgments and the practicing artist also apply to the scientist. Uh, think here about the scientist who's doing experimental science. Uh, maybe they're Think about the scientists who are working with the Hydron Collider um, and they're, they're smashing um, subatomic particles together and then mapping what comes out of those collisions and then deducing from those various features regarding uh, the natural world. Notice that when the, practice, the scientist who's actually doing those experiments doesn't have to sit and do all the theoretical work about, well, what are the principles that are undergirding uh, my practice. Now, certainly they're familiar with them because they're practicing the science according to them, but they don't have to be overly aware of what they are while they're practicing it. Now, this is important because we can begin to recognize maybe the same distinction for logic. So let's move here. Husserl says that the incomplete state of all science actually depends upon the fact that the methods of the practice do not depend upon one's understanding of the ultimate grounds of their activities. Now, hold on a second. Let's think about that for a moment. Notice here that um, every, think, take physics, for instance. And most people are pretty aware that there's a, there's a tension between Newtonian physics and quantum mechanics. Um, and that slowly we're moving to a place in where we can merge these two theories together. Um, but we haven't quite got there yet, which raises some really big questions about the nature of the universe, and also the nature about whether or not our science is complete. It doesn't seem to be complete uh, because it doesn't seem to apply consistently or universally um, in ways in which we would always come to expect. Think about the weak force of gravity, for instance. We really don't understand why gravity is such a weak force. In fact, we don't really even understand what gravity really is. Now, I'm sure there's uh, scientists out there who may be watching or um, or other members of the field who have a much, much firmer grasp on this than I certainly do. But what we can say is that since science is progressing, that demonstrates that a science is itself incomplete. Because if it was complete, it wouldn't progress. Um, so that means that since science is incomplete, that science doesn't have a complete understanding of its ultimate grounds or the, found, the ultimate foundation for its activities. Because that's the whole point of science, is to gain knowledge about the world, not to presume it. Uh, so what we realize here is that, well, our scientific theories are not as crystal clear as we like to think. And in fact, Husserl says that exactly. He says it's not crystal clear, these scientific theories which we hold. Um, of course, we teach them as being quite clear and as being logical, but the more and more you investigate scientific theory and the more and more you investigate the epistemological grounds upon which a scientific theory rests, the more and more questions you will, you will come up with. And this is because science is, an in, is in a state of incompleteness, actually. Okay? Now, number five, the theoretical completion of the separate sciences by metaphysics and the theory of science is the fifth section that Husserl wants to explore. And there's a couple key points that I take away from this section of the text. Is first off, for Husserl, we need a metaphysical explanation here. Um, that is, we need to understand something about the reality of things so that we can understand um, you know, really what's at stake. Now, when I say metaphysics here, uh, uh, or when Husserl talks about metaphysics, we should understand metaphysics here, not as a study of the spiritual world or something like this, but to understand metaphysics as a study of the principles which are implicitly in place 
such that the world is as it is, right? Um, for myself, I've always defined metaphysics as the study of that which must necessarily be the case, such that the world is as it is. So what we can say here is that what we're looking for here is a metaphysical explanation with regard to science. That is, what are the, what's the fundamental principles upon which science would depend in terms of it being an explanation? Uh, and the second point here is that a metaphysical explanation will explore and clarify the types of metaphysical presuppositions we hold regarding reality. For instance, Husserl gives the example that uh, one of the metaphysical presuppositions we hold regarding the nature of physical reality is that it occurs in space, three-dimensional space, or, or four-dimensional if you include time. Is also, and there's a whole bunch of, and what's, what is space? Space is the extension of substance. What is a substance? It's something in space. We hold, uh, so if you're a physicist, you hold a whole series of metaphysical presuppositions. That is, presuppositions regarding principles upon which you understand reality to be. Uh, number three. At present, so in Husserl's writing, the sorts of metaphysical explanations that are generally discussed are contained within the sorts of writings we see in Aristotle. But in the modern period, these sorts of metaphysical explanations get ranked under a concern of epistemology. And here it's important if we're talking about contemporary philosophy and we want to contrast it with earlier periods of philosophy, is to recognize the dominance that epistemology has within the modern period. Uh, so, for instance, uh, for the classical philosophers, metaphysics, I think, the question of what reality is itself uh, in terms of its principle, its demonstrable principles, was ultimately seen as, the, as I think, the, the primary mission of philosophy. Uh, what we see here is after the modern period, after really Descartes, what we see is the epistemology, the question of how knowledge can be attained, becomes the most important question. And so this means that a lot of the explanations that we have when we talk about metaphysical explanations really come under the category of epistemolo epistemological explanations. That is, how can we gain knowledge about things? So what makes science science is basically the question we're asking, or what Husserl is asking. And what we need is we need an investigation in order to answer this question. So number four is what we need here is a new field of inquiry and a new, a new complex discipline which can begin to untangle some of these problems. Um, and of course, if you read the fuller logical investigations, as well as Husserl's fuller work, corpus of work, you'll find he provides a whole series of discussions on all of these points. Uh, we're not going to get into all of them in this video for the obvious reason that it's just too much, right? So let's look here at section 6. Section 6 is titled The Possibility and the Justification of Logic as a theory of science. So science concerns knowing and it concerns knowledge, but science is not the sum tissue of knowledge. That's Husserl's phrase here, the sum tissue of knowledge. What does he mean here? Science is concerned with how we know things, but how we know things is not the same thing as science. So what you can say is that knowledge is a necessary part of science, but it's not a sufficient part of it. And because think about this, you can know things in a non-scientific sense. I, for instance, know that my mother's name is Rebecca, but um, <laughs> I don't know that in a scientific sense, right? So if science was just about knowledge, then we would have to say that that statement about my mother's name is, in fact, a scientific claim, and that's not right. Um, and also, conversely, not everything that science is concerned with, science is concerned with knowledge predominantly, but it's concerned with other things as well. Take a look at this quote that Husserl, said, Husserl gives us from, from page 17 of the text. He says, rather we may say, if it's to be called knowledge in the narrowest, strictest sense, it requires to be evident to have the luminous certainty that what we have not acknowledged is, that what we have rejected is not, a certainty distinguished in a familiar fashion from blind belief, from vague opining, um, however firm and decided, if we're not to be shattered on the rocks of extreme skepticism. Now, one thing here is, if, we're to, if we want, we can define what is knowledge. And we can define it in a very, very strict sense by saying, well, knowledge is when we say something, when we make a claim, that that claim is, in fact, the way it is. Notice his emphasis on is. on in, What does the word is refer to? 
is refers to the being of things. So when we make a claim and we know that claim to in, as knowledge, that claim has some sort of link to the way in which things really are. It has some sort of connection to reality. And conversely, if it, when we say that we know that something, when we reject a claim and we know that something is false, what we're saying is that it is not. We're denying its place within reality. So this is sort of interesting here. So knowledge in this very, very strict propositional sense is related to reality, and it's related to it in both an affirmative as well as a negative manner. Now, Husserl discusses what we might call marks of truth. And this is, we might think of this way, is that when a science establishes or develops its claims regarding what can be known, it does so by recognizing things of which reveal the truth of whether or not a claim is or is not. This is the marks of truth. Okay. Uh, now there's a duality to knowledge. Uh, on the one hand, notice that knowledge has, there's degrees of knowledge. So you can know something more or less. And, but we can contrast this with the affirmation of the known in the way we just had it earlier. Um, so what we, hear is, what we see here is that there's a duality of knowledge uh, where we have, on the one hand, the probability of what's known versus the specific affirmation of something. In logic, the specific affirmation of something it takes the general form of S is P, right? Uh, you say that a subject is a predicate. So, for instance, I say uh, the coffee cup is light or something like that, or the coffee cup is white, right? That's a specific affirmation, but think if I make a different sort of claim of knowledge. What if I say uh, the the weather, or I don't know, I'm probably, this is bad because I'm trying to come up with an example while I'm recording this video, but uh, think about if I make a claim regarding uh, the, the, the move, the hypothetical claim about why I think something may or may not happen. I have a degree of knowledge, but it's a sort of probability, and so it seems to be different. And here we can say is that it looks like science is more than just merely this specific affirmative claim. And here we can distinguish what, Husserl doesn't quite say this, but I think this is the gist of it, what we might say is the parts of knowledge versus the whole character of what can be known. And it looks like that what science requires is, quote, a systematic coherence in the theoretical sense. Take a look at these two quotations from page 18 of the Logical Investigations. Husserl says, The system particular to science, i.e. to true and correct science, is not our own invention, but is present in things where we simply find or discover it. A little bit later, well, let's keep reading. He says, Science seeks to be a means towards the greatest possible conquest of the realm of truth by our knowledge. The realm of truth is, however, no disordered chaos, but is dominated and unified by law. So, for Husserl, he, you can see here he's making very specific commitments regarding the nature of logic. And that is, is that, number one, is he thinks that uh, the, the system that's particular to science isn't just about inventing claims which are true about the world, it's about discovering claims which are true about the world. And this is the notion of a scientific law. A scientific law is not created by us. A scientific law is rather discovered by us. This is ultimately what, what, um, uh, what Husserl's commitment will be. And we talked about this with our discussion of Frege a little bit earlier. Now, here, there's another quote I want to give you here, where Husserl says, or he argues that the inward evidence of the probability of a state of affairs, A, will not serve to ground the inward evidence of his truth, but it will serve to ground those comparative inwardly evident value assessments through which, in accordance with the positive or negative probability values, we can distinguish the reasonable from the unreasonable, the better founded from the worst founded assumptions and surmises. What's what's real talking about here? Well, really, he's talking about the question about the method of science, and the sorts of subjective certainty that we can have with regard to how we progress through a science. Put it this way, if science is, as Husserl suggests, a discovery about the way the world actually is, then that means that the ultimate claims we make in science cannot be simply based upon my own subjective certainty, upon my own um, 
how confident I intuitively feel about a claim. Now, my own intuition and my subjective certainty can play a role in terms of the way in which we recognize what's better or worse in terms of our assumptions or what's a better or worse type of argument. But ultimately, the evidence of the truth of something isn't given simply by this inward grounding. That means there has to be some sort of objective methodology at play within science. Um, so you can see here is that Husserl is trying to link together an analysis of both the objective conditions for science as well as the subjective conditions for our experience of science. Because remember, when a scientist is making arguments, they are doing something in their mind. They are operating through some type of subjective certainty that's concerned with logic. And it's going to be really critical to Husserl's discussion of logic and whether or not it's ultimately objective uh, to determine well, what the ultimate grounds for the certainty of our scientific statements would be or might be. So you can see here what the importance of method is and how it, how it must have a relationship to the truth. Um, so notice here that science is not simply about knowing, but science is also concerned with the methodology by which we have knowledge. And method is ultimately concerned with the way in which our propositions about things within the science relate to the truth of the things that we can know. So notice here is that when we talk about science, we can't dispense with the category of truth. Truth is absolutely essential here in terms of, of understanding this. So notice here some of the commitments for Husserl logic as well as science is about how the world is. It's not about how we understand the world. And that's a way in which the basic dichotomy between psychologism and Husserl's and Frege's view is, right? Husserl and Frege, in my, in my reading, are both committed to the idea that logic is about, how, is about the discovery of essential laws which govern reason which are embedded in the world somehow. It's not simply a, a study of the psychology of what human beings have invented in terms of how to perceive and how best to understand the world. Okay, moving to section 10 of the text. Uh, the title of this, this section is The Ideas of Theory... Uh, and science has the problems of the theory of science. Uh, sorry, there's a little typo there. Uh, so first point here is that science is not just the validation of hypothetical propositions. Now, most of us have been taught that science has, there's a scientific method, and it involves making hypotheses, formulating problems, making hypotheses, testing for those hypotheses, falsifying hypotheses, and so on and so forth. And that's certainly true within the material sciences. That's part of scientific methodology. But notice that science is not simply the validation of these types of propositions. Science is also concerned with the unity of validity for the interconnection between propositions. Right? That is, science isn't concerned with just one simple claim about the world. Science is concerned with the whole field, the whole family of different claims, and how they're interconnected in terms of there being a unity between them. Notice that how does science proceed in terms of its method today? Well, if a, if a scientist makes an experiment, they don't have claim to say that they know some, that their hypotheses are true or false. What we do is scientists will publish their results within a journal or through some other means, and then that will allow other scientists to try to run those exact same experiments to see if they also get the same results. And what we see here is that when more and more scientists get the same results and uh, they're able to falsify certain ways of seeing the problem uh, that don't match up with the results, what we develop is we develop a sort of unity that connects all of these different experiments together into a general theory. Okay. Now, what this means is that science is, is not just about a singular method for a singular experiment. It's about the overall unity and the interconnection of the propositions we take to be true for the field of study. Now, this reveals that science has a sort of teleological goal. Now, the word teleological, Husserl uses, it comes from the Greek term telos, which means something like the end or goal towards which things aim. And if you take a look at one of my videos on Husserl's metaphysics, for instance, you can see I discuss teleology in the Aristotelian sense. Now, for Husserl, he's going to employ this language of telos simply to articulate the idea that there's, a, there's an end state or there's a goal that's organizing the field of science. And that end goal 
concerns the unity of all of our knowledges or all of the things we take to be known. So in other words, science uh, must have a systematic unity. Uh, thus, what we have to do is we have to establish what the validity procedures are for developing a systematic unity and a method within a field of science. So that means that uh, since the unity of the interconnection is a, such an important part of science, that means that before we can even get to things like making experiments and making claims about the world, we have to first establish what, what are the procedures themselves which can establish valid inferences and valid uh, arguments and, and so on and so forth. Which brings us to logic, because logic is a central, mecha is a central tool that gets used within all of the sciences. In other words, uh, if, if you want, without going into the systematic and you know sort of rigorous definition of logic, just think of logic as that which is reasonable, right? And put it this way, a scientist has to make arguments in terms of how they understand their experiments, and those arguments have to be reasonable. If they're not reasonable, they don't make sense, and if they don't make sense, we should reject them, because something which can't make sense can't really be known. Uh, so which means that all of the sciences, whether we're talking about chemistry, physics, or mathematics, or psychology, all of these sciences depend upon logic in order to do their work. Now, that doesn't mean that the chemist or the psychologist or the mathematician has to ultimately be concerned with, with logic proper and the foundations for logic in order to do their work. But it does mean that they have to incorporate logical argumentation into what they do. Now, the closest would be the mathematician. The mathematician, there's a debate here, might be said to be studying logic. Uh, there's a debate, you know, Frege is a part of that debate about whether or not uh, logic forms the foundation for mathematics or vice versa. Uh, and so there's an interesting discussion there. Now, and it seems to be that for Frege, for Husserl, he takes the same position that Frege does, though in a sort of different sense. So that means that science and the method that science uses depends upon the aim towards which a science is directed. So if I am a psychologist and I want to understand what sort of uh, is causing you to be depressed, then that means I have to use a, the specific methods which are attuned to determining that sort of aim. And those would be very different methods from if I'm doing chemistry and I want to understand, you know, why water uh, works the way it does when it has a specific chemical composition or something, right? So that means the science and method depend upon this teleological direction, which sort of founds, if you will, the subject matter upon which that science is organized. So how does logic fit into this? Well, logic in this sense is a, something of a normative discipline. Now, how can we understand this idea of normative or norms? And what I'm going to say is that normative, simply put, can be understood as establishing standards for validity, right? Think of uh, a norm as a standard, right? A lot of times we talk about normativity with regard to ethics, but we can also talk about logic as being its own normative discipline. And what that means is that logic will establish or articulate the conditions and the rules by which you can accept something as being either reasonable or unreasonable. And this means that logic is a normative discipline also for establishing some very general propositions regarding truth itself and the way in which truth can be articulated in language. Sort of two quotations I wanted to pull to your attention uh, from page 21 of the text. Husserl says, quote, A normative discipline never sets forth universal criteria any more than a theory states, you, I'm sorry, any more than a therapy states universal symptoms. This should be therapy, not theory. A little typo there. And take a look at the next quote. It comes a little bit later in the text from that first passage where Husserl says, quote, where the basic norm is an end or can become an end, the norm of discipline by a ready extension of its task gives rise to a technology. So in other words, when we look at the relationship of logic to science, what we see is that logic can become a technology. It becomes a technology of science. Now, when we talk about technology, we frequently think of technology as being, you know, things like your cell phone and your computer. And we sort of think of new technologies as being technology. 
But what is a technology? Technology comes from the root term techne in Greek. And the way in which we can think of a techne is some sort of, the best way would be to think of it in terms of a technique. Some sort of functional um, operation by which something practical can come about. So that's sort of what a technology is. And in the broadest sense of the term, language is a technology for communication, right? Cups are a technology for drinking. Logic is a technology for science. It's a technology for making inferences from states of affairs or evidence to conclusions or theses or claims. So logic can become a sort of technology. Now, we're going to see, though, that Husserl thinks that logic is not simply that. But what we want to do here is figure out the where logic fits within the broader schema here of science. Now, so that means that what we could say in this perspective is that logic is the technology of correct judgments, making correct judgments. And what Husserl does in this section is he contrasts this view with the work of Bergman, who talks about technology as an activity, or Schleiermacher, who thinks of uh, logic as a technology of scientific knowledge, or Balzano, a very, very famous uh, uh, logician, who thought of logic as a preliminary critical search. Um, um, and, and so Husserl does a little bit uh, historical work in this section by looking at what some of the relevant definitions of logic are and how they relate to ultimately this larger discussion. I'm not going to belabor the point here. It's more historical than it's necessary for the argument. So this jumps us into chapter two of the logical investigations. Chapter two of the logical investigations is titled The Theoretical Disciplines as the Foundation of normative disciplines. Now notice here is that so far we've treated logic as a normative thing, as something which establishes standards and therefore it has a sort of technicality, a techno technological aspect or dimension to it. But what Husserl is going to argue in this chapter is that when you talk about standards, if you take a normative discipline and you take logic as being a normative discipline, what, what's the foundation of a normative discipline? It has to be a theoretical discipline. In other words, before you can understand the standards, you have to understand the theory upon which those standards are based or upon which those standards are presupposed. Uh, so this sort of takes us into a widening out of the concept of logic. So section 14 is titled The Concept of Normative Science, the basic standard or the principle that gives it unity. Now, what is a normative? What does normative mean? In my definition, the Thorsby definition, which is not a very um, strict definition, would be what's normative is that which signifies a standard, right? Uh, the standard is normative. So when we talk about a normative science, we can say there's really two different senses for a normative. On the one hand, uh, normative refers to the norms that we should follow, right? And here, Husserl really gives examples that are come right out of ethics and um, come out of aesthetics and things like this, where we might say, for example, a soldier should be brave, right? And this has the central form of saying an A should be a B. And here, when you, as you're reading this section, you really get the strong sense that Husserl is a logician and a mathematician because he consistently wants to formalize all of these statements and give a formalistic treatment of them. But first notice here is that the norms that we should follow don't mean that we have to follow them. A soldier should be brave, but that doesn't mean that a soldier is brave, right? Now, notice this is different from the types of norms that we, we use in logic for validity. Because if you want a valid argument, you have to follow these things. It's not just simply um, a suggestion, as it were, right? Um, so the second type of norms would be norms that we must essentially follow. So my example, and this doesn't come from the text, but it is related to the larger work of Husserl's phenomenology, is you might say that awareness must be intentional. Now, what is intentionality? For Husserl in his later work, um, and later on he'll, he discusses this, is that intentionality is the directedness of consciousness. You can never be conscious of everything or nothing. You can only be conscious of something, one thing at a time. In other words, you can only be conscious of something. So, for example, right now I'm conscious of the coffee cup. Now I'm conscious of the pen. But I can't be conscious of the pen and be conscious of the cup at the exact same time unless I sort of combine them in the unity of my field of experience. 
Uh, so that means that whenever you're aware of something, you always have an intentionality to it. And if you don't have intentionality, you're not aware of it. So in other words, this structure of normativity is, the, is essential normativity. And it takes the form of an A must be a B. Uh, so in other words here, what we have here is a distinction in normativity. Um, so the first type of normativity would apply to ethics, for instance, and politics. Imagine if you said a president should tell the truth, for instance. Um, that's, but a president doesn't have to tell the truth. Uh, but, for instance, if I say that um, a, a, a logical argument must be valid, that's something essential to it. Now, another key distinction that's related here is the difference between necessary and sufficient conditions. And Husserl discusses this at some length. What we can say is that, uh, on the one hand, a, science, a normative science can concern the necessary conditions for something to occur. But this is not the same thing as, as discussing or investigating the sufficient conditions for something. If you're new to philosophy, you'll want to make sure to take care to really get a handle on this difference between necessary and sufficient conditions. Um, so, for instance, to drive your car, it's necessary that you have fuel in the car. But it's not sufficient because if you don't have an engine, it doesn't matter how much fuel you've got in the fuel tank. It's never going to drive. So another example here would be uh, a sufficient condition for being a mother is giving birth to a baby or adopting a baby, let's say. Uh, those are sufficient. If you do those things, then you're a mother. That's all you have to do. So there's a difference here between necessary and sufficient conditions. And this difference also comes into play when we talk about normativity and the way in which logic um, would, would evaluate um, the necessary and su sufficient conditions of things. Now, there is a difference here between the essential forms of normative propositions, which Husserl lays out in this chapter. I'm not going to give an exhaustive treatment of those because it's fairly formulaic and it doesn't translate well into a video. Um, but we can talk about the essential forms of these normative propositions. But what we'll also recognize is that when we're talking about these things as being normative, we're also making value judgments in terms of what the way something should be and what we value as being the way, as what we value over and against something else. So notice here what Husserl does is he disentangles the notion that we have value judgments from the idea that there's an essential form to these normative propositions. And this begins to highlight the distinction for Husserl between a normative science and a theoretical science. Right? A theoretical science is concerned with the form of things, uh, whereas the normative is concerned with the application of these value um, judgments to the science. Let's take a look here. He says, um, in making a normative proposition, we hold value judgments that refer to, to a given norm. Whoops, that's a little intense. Uh, we refer to value judgments that refer, let me reread that. In making a normative proposition, we hold a value judgment that refers to a given norm. I say the, uh, uh, the, the, the soldier should be brave. I'm valuing bravery with regard to that statement. Now this means that, quote, an intention is affected having the content that something is valuable or good. Uh, now conversely, whoops, all forms of normative propositions therefore have a sort of definite sense. Every constitutive property B of a good A yields, for example, a proposition of the four, an A should be a B, um, or an A should be B. And this comes from 25. And again, that means that, again, all forms of normative propositions have a definite sense. Um, and it's related to these value judgments. Take a look at this, uh, uh, this quotation here I've pulled from the text. Where Husserl says, Finally, as regards the concepts of the normative judgment, we can, following our analysis, describe it in the following way. In relation to a general underlying valuation and the content of the corresponding pair of value predicates determined by it, every proposition is said to be normative that states a necessary or a sufficient or a necessary and sufficient condition for having such a predicate. Now, it may take you some time to sort of unfurl that for yourself, but what Husserl is trying to do here is lay out very clearly the formal structure for these normative propositions that we take. Because remember, if, if we take logic to be a technology, and as a normative science, we're trying to understand uh, 
of how that works and what the sorts of propositions are that logic has to be associated with to do that. So there's some other key points I want to mention that come out of the text. I um, mean, he doesn't number them here, but I've numbered them just for our site for our, for the sake of clarity. Number one is that we value the knowledge of laws more highly than singular facts. So a science is ultimately interested in terms of the laws which organize facts, not with the facts themselves. Um, frequently, one way of understanding this is frequently said that, for instance, a theory stands higher than facts. Um, facts are the specific elements which. Um, which help us understand or develop a scientific theory, but a scientific theory in general is about how all of the facts are unified under some set of common principles or some set of common or consistent understandings. Um, so that means that the knowledge of these laws is actually more important than the knowledge of these particular singular facts. Number two, the sum totals of all of these norms form a closed group within this, a specific science. So number three, what we have here are basic norms. Now, a basic norm, Husserl defines as, quote, the normative proposition which demands, generally, of two objects of a sphere that they should measure up to the constitutive features of the positive value predicate to the greatest extent possible. Uh, there's a, that's a lot to, that's, a, that's a, um, a mouthful there, and I would encourage you to take a look at Husserl's discussion of it. Um, and you kind of have to probably chew that one over a little bit. But this is the section where he defines what a, a basic norm is. Why is that important? Well, a basic norm can also be called the definition for the conception of what's good within a science. Right? So in the case of ethics, if I say um, a soldier should be brave, what, I'm, what my value judgment there is that bravery is something good for the soldier to have. Right? So a basic norm is related to this conception of good. Now, we're thinking of good there in this sort of ethical sense or sociological sense, but we could apply it equally into other conditions, right? You could ask yourself, what's a good experiment? And there you're going to come up with basic norms regarding how certain types of experiments should be conducted, for instance, in material physics. Number five, a normative discipline has its own basic norms, which is, in each case, its unifying principle. So if you have an entire discipline that has a normative feature to it, like logic, then that means that that norm of discipline will have its own norms uh, that, that form you know, the unifying principle upon which that science or discipline operates. And this is ultimately reveals a theoretical discipline underlying the normative. So number six, theoretical disciplines do not have this central reference of all researched to a fundamental valuation as the source of a dominant a normative interest. Okay, let's move here to number 15. Normative disciplines and technology. What we can say here, and what I really, I'm just keeping it brief here, is that a normative interest is naturally dominant in the case of real objects as the objects of practical valuations. So it's pretty straightforward. If you're doing something practically in the world and, you're, and, you, need, and you need a normative, and you have a normative interest, you want to do something correctly, then uh, that makes sense. That's where naturally the normative interest dominates the field. And this is where we get the idea that logic is a technology. But for Husserl, this is an unsustainable position because the logic is technology position um, also presupposes a certain theoretical positioning regarding about the general conditions or the basic norms for logic. So if logic is a technology for how we ought to think, then that means that there must be norms which govern that technology. Well, if there's norms which govern that technology, then those are theoretical in their positioning. So that means, number 16, that the theoretical disciplines um, can serve as the foundation of normative disciplines. So what's who's real committed to here? Number one is that every normative discipline presupposes a theoretical discipline. There has to be a theoretical content that's free of a normative configuration. Um, because the normative configuration concerns with how we should apply something to a particular case, but the theoretical content concerns the understanding of how things are unified in general before you actually apply them. Uh, put it this way, before you could build, this is not the type of technology that Husserl is referring to, but put it this way, before you could build the type of technology that we have here when we look at uh, cell phones, right, and we look at um, a smartphone. This type of technology 
depends upon a certain sorts of theories about the way in which physical things work. How does light operate? How does an accelerometer work? What are the conditions, the physical, theoretical um, claims that have to be known before you can build something like this? Before you can have a technology, a science has to precede it. Um, it's frequently, um, people frequently complain that um, theoretical science doesn't have a practical import. But it's also noted that most of the practical technologies we have first begin by scientists looking into the theoretical conditions of things. And so Husserl, I think, is in very much broad agreement with, gener with scientists generally speaking here. Um, he says that theoretical relations, uh, which our discussion has shown to lie hidden in the propositions of normative sciences, must have their logical place in certain theoretical sciences. That is, every normative discipline demands that we know certain non-normative truths. We have to know things about the world before we can know how we ought to apply them to the world. So, what are the essential foundations of a normative science, and how are these going to be understood? And this sort of brings us to chapter 3, Husserl's discussion of psychologism. Now, you can see Husserl's going sort of about this very systematically and very slowly, trying to articulate and delimit the field of logic so that he can ultimately attack the position of psychologism and then propose his own complex science, which ultimately is um, a version of the phenomenological method building up. Um, so what is psycho So this chapter is called Psychologism, Its Arguments, and Its Attitude to the Usual Counter-Arguments. Um, and this will probably serve as where we're going to end our video. Um, so you can see here that what I want to do in this video is really introduce you to the way in which Husserl understands logic and understands some of these problems, but also introduce you to his arguments regarding psychologism, and in particular his rejection of psychologism, and it can be found in this chapter. So what's the basic question here? And the question is, do the foundations lie in our psychology? Um, now, there seem to be good reasons for thinking this. Um, and we'll talk about those here in a moment. Section 17 is the disputed question as to whether the essential theoretical foundations of normal logic lie in psychology. And the question here is, are the foundations of logic derived from psychology? And uh, Husserl here is referring specifically to Mill and Theodore Lipps, both uh, John Stuart Mill and Theodore Lips, both who fall within what we, what we might call the psychologist camp. And their view is ultimately that logic is ultimately rooted in our mental state of affairs, and our mental state of affairs are ultimately rooted in the psychological frameworks or the psychology, um, the psychological laws which govern our mental formations. So this is what we might call the psychologist camp. Um, and, and famously, John Stuart Mill is also an empiricist with regarding to all this. So he doesn't think, um, well, I won't get into that. He thinks mathematics is empirical or it's all posteriori, not a priori. But anyway, let's keep going here. Section 18 concerns the line of the proof of the psychologistic figures. So what's their argument? Well, if logic is a technology, then it must have a practical regulation. Right? It must have a means by which we can practically regulate our way of seeing and understanding the world, and our way of relating propositional content together. And this uh, requires a specific psychological capacity in order to successfully complete a practical regulation, right? That is, since logic is a technology and it's something which concerns the way in which we think, therefore, the psychology is also concerned with how we think, therefore, it would seem thus that psychology can serve potentially as this theoretical basis for a logical technology. Um, okay, so that's, that's what psychologism is there. Psychologism would be the view that psychology is the, is the theoretical foundation for the normative features of logic. Now, what are the usual arguments of the opposition and the psychologistic rejoinder? Now, the first way you can see this is that psychology concerns thinking and thinking concerns natural laws. Well, logic might concern normative thinking, and therefore, logic would concern normative laws. The problem with this view is that, well, logic would only serve be a series of contingent laws. So if you think that logic basically forms the foundation for thinking and it's based in natural laws, and logic is concerned with normative thinking, which is merely just a species of thinking, therefore, a species of the psychological um, 
conditions for thinking, then that means that the normative laws would therefore be based upon these psycho psychological natural laws. The problem, though, is that this means that all of logic becomes nothing but a series of contingent laws. Now, contingent laws can be contrasted with necessary laws. Something is necessary if it's absolutely essential for that thing to occur, right? This is what uh, John, David Hume referred to as a necessary connection, right? Um, but if logic is merely contingent, that would mean that logic isn't necessary. It, the, the, the features of logic are only true under specific conditions. They're not necessarily true. Um, and this doesn't really make sense because logic really is about necessary laws. So, for instance, if you're studying basic logic, you'll discover that the modus ponens type of argument, which is if A, then B, A, therefore B, right? If it's raining, then you get wet. It is raining, therefore you are wet. An argument like that is deductive and it's necessary. And it looks like there are certain laws which govern those types of arguments. So, for instance, one of the most famous laws of logic is a law that comes from Aristotle called the law of non-contradiction, which states that something can never both be and not be, or something can never be said to both be and not be at the same time in the same manner and in the same respect. So I can't say that I'm holding the cup of coffee and I'm not holding the cup of coffee at the same time in the same manner and in the same respect. That doesn't make any sense. I love. I always give the example of imagine if you if you if you had a teacher. And you go to your teacher and you say, what's my grade in the class? And the teacher says, you have an A. And you say, oh, good. And then the teacher says, yeah, but you also have an F. You would say, well, do I have an A or an F? And if the teacher said, you have an A and an F simultaneously, uh, it would be very confusing because it wouldn't make any sense. Um, and the law of not contradiction appears to be necessary because if you break it, it doesn't, it seems to be uh, necessary in that normatively secondary sense. It must be the case. It's not simply contingent. The problem here is that psychology, if it's based upon natural laws, it's ultimately based upon contingent laws so far as we can empirically understand or experience or recognize them. Right. So what we see here is that the rules of logic must therefore be taken not from the contingent, but from the necessary use of reason, which one finds in oneself apart from all psychology. That is, the law of non-contradiction applies regardless of the psychological mental states of a person. Maybe a person really does think that they're holding the cup of coffee and they're not holding the cup of coffee at the same time. But the problem here is that that will never make sense under any conditions, which means that the rules of logic seem to concern the necessary uses of reason, not simply the contingent forms of reasoning that take place. If psychology is an empirical discipline, that is, psychology begins by, by studying and observing how people think and then deriving law, natural laws from those, um, um, uh, from those descriptions, then that means that psychology can only derive contingent states of affairs rather than necessary states of affairs. So you can see here right from the beginning, there's a disconnect between logic in terms of its necessity and psychology in terms of its contingency. So what's the typical rejoinder here? Well, um, Husserl says, well, such arguments don't really dismay the psychologistic logicians. They answer, quote, a necessary use of the understanding is nonetheless a use of the understanding and belongs with the understanding itself to psychology. Thinking as it should be is merely a special case of thinking as it is. So psychology must certainly investigate the natural laws of thinking, the laws which hold for all judgments whatever, whether they're correct or false. It would, however, be absurd to interpret this proposition as if such laws only were psychological as applied with the most embracing generality to all judgments whatever, whereas special laws of judgment, like the laws of correct judgment, were shut out from its purview. So here, take a look, uh, Husserl recommends, for, for, by example, to John Stuart Mill's discussion of an examination. Uh, he's pointing out, it looks like uh, page 459 in the footnote. Uh, I'll let you look at that in your research. But on that same page here, let me go here, we also see this discussion. Uh, why is it there? Okay. 
The rules, therefore, Husserl says, the rules, therefore, on which one must proceed in order to think rightly are merely rules on which one must proceed in order to think as the nature of thought, its specific lawfulness demands. They are, in short, identical with the natural laws of thinking itself. Logic is a physics of thinking, or it's nothing at all. So this is Theodore Lips, right? And this is his view, um, ultimately, which is a psychologistic view. And their view, ultimately, is that it doesn't mean anything. Namely, psychology, because it concerns the natural laws that would apply for a thinking being as such, they're always going to be top dog. So the psychologist, uh, the, psycho the logician who takes the psychological framework, isn't really perturbed by Husserl's sort of beginning argument here. Now, Husserl wants to distinguish the difference of psychology here from logic. Psychology investigates the laws which govern the real connection of our mental events with one another, as well as with the related mental dispositions and the corresponding events in the bodily organism. So for the psychologist, law concerns a sort of comprehensive formula. And the connection here is supposed to, in principle, be causal, uh, where one set of affairs causes another set of affairs within your mental state. Um, and the, here, for the psychologist, truth conditions are not a, a central investigatory concern. We saw in Frege, and certainly Husserl agrees, that logic is essentially concerned with these truth conditions. So if psychology is the preeminent science upon which logic is based, then we have a big problem here, which is namely, where do these truth conditions as a central categorical feature for the sciences come from, the, for the science come from? And the other thing here is that a law for logic is not simply a comprehensive formula. It's, it seems to be a necessary formula. And the connection is not one of causal and effect. The connection really seems to concern the a priori relationships between things. For Husserl, logic is not a study of causal origins at all, right? But it's an investigation into their truth content. So what this means is that logic does in fact relate to psychology the way a part is related to a whole. But it doesn't mean that psychology, that logic and psycho that psychology is the whole of logic. And this is a sort of whole part, if you will, um, fallacy that Husserl seems to be waging against the psychologistic camp in, lo in logic. And by the way, to be clear here, we're not attacking, and Husserl's not attacking psychology. His view isn't that psychology isn't a science or isn't important. His view ultimately is that the psychologistic impulse for the logician is an incorrect way of seeing the problem. It's an incorrect way of understanding what logic is all about. Right? Husserl reveals his ultimate commitment in this section, section 20, as being ultimately anti-psychologistic. He says, well, what the psychologistic arguments show is that the psychology helps in the foundation of logic, uh, not that it has the only or the main parts in this, not that it provides logic's essential foundation in the sense that there was defined in section 16. So Husserl here is certainly anti-psychologistic here. I mean, in fact, he would frequently go on to discuss this in many different ways. So let's now here move to chapter 4, and this is sort of the next tick in Husserl's argument against psychologism, and it concerns the empiricistic consequences of psychologism. Let's take a brief moment here and remind ourselves what that means. Empiricism is the general position that knowledge comes by our experience and our um, observation, our, sen our observation of our sense experience of the world, right? So for instance, I know empirically that I'm holding a coffee cup because I have a certain sensation in my hand that is, you know, represented in my mind and so forth. Um, when the scientist is doing a, an experiment that forces them to observe something, they are taking an empirical approach to their problem. Now, psychology is ultimately empirical, right? How does psychology operate? Well, psychology operates by putting people in specific sorts of conditions, seeing how they react, and then deriving or deducing what's causing those conditions to occur. But importantly, it always takes this empirical approach. It doesn't take an a priori approach, rather it takes an a posteriori approach. 
So that means that we come here now to section 22, which concerns the laws of thought as opposed to the laws of nature, which operate in isolation, and, and taking these as the cause of rational thought. So the idea here is that psychologism takes the view that psychology uh, leads us to the investigation of causal laws, ca the laws which govern cause and effect relationships for the mental experiences we have. And these causal laws, since they're, in, since they're taken from our experience, are inductive. If they're inductive, that means they concern the probability of things, and they're given as a probability, which means that there's no abs absolute certainty that's available um, for the psychologist. In other words, every psychological theory, insofar as it is empirically derived, is necessarily only probably the case. It can never be shown without with 100% uh, certainty or without any doubt whatsoever that what the psychologist is arguing ultimately really is the case. And that's not because of a failure of psychology. It is merely a feature of the empirical grounds upon which psychology is based. So that means that if there is no absolute certainty, there's a sort of probabilistic stamp to um, psychology which holds in an um, ad infinitum. That means it, it, this probabilistic stamp applies to all the entire domain of psychology. Now you can see here what ultimately he's going to argue is, well the problem here is that logic is about necessary relationships, not about probabilistic relationships, which means that psychology can't really serve as the theoretical foundation for logic. Um, because if that was the case, it would make the knowledge really just unstable. Um, you wouldn't be able to really ever know the things you said you know. Um, in other words, uh, it would reduce logic to a sort of game of chance, throwing of the dice, as it were. Um, Husserl has this great quote. He says, where on earth is the proof that the pure operation of these laws would yield correct laws of thinking? Right. So what we have here are what, we, what Husserl calls the confusions of psychologism. And the, the key one here is that the logical laws, if you take the psychologistic stance, these logical laws seem to be confused with the judgments themselves. In other words, the contents of the judgments, uh, which is the logical judgments, right, about the truth of things, get confused with the judgments themselves. Uh, the fact that you're making a judgment, right? So if I'm making a judgment, I'm obviously taking a psychological stance because I have a brain and I have a mind that's operating in a certain way and I'm creating a certain mental stance. But the fact that I'm making a judgment is not the same thing as the content of my judgment. It's not the same thing as what I'm actually saying in my judgment, right? Um, so notice here is if I make the judgment, this pen is red, right? The, the, the statement that this pen is red the content of that judgment is not the same thing as the mental process I use to make the judgment. Um, so here you can see there that what Husserl seems to be doing is disentangling the idea that there that we do have psychological elements in our thinking, but those thinking those psychological elements don't form the basis for logic because logic is concerned with the truth conditions of our judgments, which is the content of the judgment or uh, an important condition for the content of these judgments. So Husserl gives this suggestion. He says, imagine there's an ideal person. Uh, he gives a thought experiment here, right? Imagine there's a person who's really ideal where they can only think logically. They can only think logically. Now ask yourself, would the natural laws which govern the psychology of these mental operations and these logical laws in this situation be the same? Because if the... Um, Put it this way, if the psy, psy, the logician who takes the psycho, uh, psychologism position seriously, if a person could only think uh, logically and psychologism is true, then the natural laws of psychology should be identical with what with the logical laws that that person employs. But are those two things going to be the same? No, they're not going to be the same, right? The causal laws that would enable a person to think aren't going to be identical to the laws that govern what they think, right? How, or that govern how they think, right? So the laws of non-contradiction would become a causal natural law, which doesn't make any sense, particularly because all of the natural causal laws we have 
depend in principle upon the law of non-contradiction. So you have a whole range of confusion here. By the way, that's the, not t. Um, so as continuing, continuing with the slide here, we can say is that one does not appeal to natural laws, for instance, when they're doing mathematics, right? If I'm doing mathematics and, and I'm trying to teach mathematics, say, for instance, to my young daughter, and I'm explaining something, I don't explain to her the, the propositions of mathematics by appealing to the natural psychological laws um, that are governing her ability to think, right? To do that is to confuse the, the idea of how we make judgments with what we're making judgments about. And um, this is the key problem that Husserl feels the psychologistic logician makes. Um, here's a quote that he, had, he gives us. Whoa, whoops, sorry about that. Let's go back. Uh, my computer, I don't think, is doing well here. Uh, I just want to zoom in. The psychologistic logician ignores the fundamental, essential, never-to-be-bridged gulf between ideal and real laws, between normative and causal regulation, between logical and real necessity, between logical and real grounds. In other words, ultimately, I think what we'll see here is that what the psychologistic logician does is they, they commit the fallacy of equivocation, where they're treating two things as being equal that are not really equal. And that is a logical formal law is not the same thing as a real causal law. And to, and to treat those together is to ultimately equivocate and, and uh, commit a fallacy of reductivism. Uh, and this is ultimately what Husserl is going to be arguing against. And he thinks it's absolutely essential if we're to get a handle and a grip on how things mean, right, to understand this sort of differentiation. And frequently, I, for instance, I'll say that I think my students frequently commit these fallacies that Husserl is talking about. And what, why do I say that? A lot of times when I'm talking to my students about logic, uh, my students will end up starting to talk about brain science. And they'll start telling me about how the brain works. They'll be like, well, the brain works this way. And all the they're doing is they're pointing out physicalistic properties that underlie the cause and effect connection between the brain and the mind's capacity to create mental events, to create thinking. But that's not the same thing as logic. That's an equivocation here. Now, there's a third consequence to psychologism and Husserl discusses its refutation. He says, if the laws of logic have their epistemological source in the psychological matters of fact, right? If, they're, if they are normative transformations of such facts, they must themselves be psychological in content, both by being laws for mental states and also by presupposing or implying the existence of such states. This is palpably false because no logical laws imply a matter of fact. And take, for instance, the logical law of the law of non-contradiction. What sort of matter of fact, what fact does the law of non-contradiction imply? The answer is it implies no facts, right? Um, and think about mathematics, for instance. If you learn um, trigonometry, have you learned something about the world? Have you learned a fact about the world? Not in an empirical sense, um, maybe you've learned something about the, a logical fact of the world, but you haven't learned about a, uh, an empirical way of the world, which means that you don't have a psychological epistemology in play when you're doing these sorts of disciplines. So in other words, as I mentioned before, this means that psychology cannot form the foundation for logic, the theoretical foundation. Um, but that's not to deny that there is a theoretical relationship to psychology. In chapter 24, he calls it the continuation, so he's just sort of continuing on. I sort of pulled a couple quotes here I, I thought would be helpful. Husserl says, All knowledge of these laws rest upon experience, but not all such knowledge arises out of experience inductively by the well-known logical process, which goes from singular facts or empirical generalities of a lower level to these general laws. The laws of logic are in particular empirical, but not inductive. So the laws of logic might be empirical in the sense that they do rest upon our experience of thinking, um, but this is not; these are not inductive, but rather necessary relationships 
to the form of thinking, forms of thinking which are possible and fortuitously not possible. So psychological presuppositions for logic are not the basis for the logical presuppositions or the grounds of the premises themselves. One of the things here in logic is logic concerns the relationship between premises and, and a conclusion, right? There, and in logic, there should be an inferential relationship to the conclusion such that for instance, if I say two premises, you should be able to infer what the conclusion will be. So, for instance, if I say all men are mortal and Socrates is a man, you can infer the conclusion that Socrates, therefore, well, he must be mortal. Um, and that's a famous argument that goes back to Aristotle. Now, notice here is that um, the, the inference here ultimately um, is concerned that an inferential pattern moving from the premises to the conclusion depends upon the theoretical foundation for the premises themselves. The fact that logic begins with psychological events does not mean that it arises from experience. In other words, the fact that logic arises from our mental life doesn't mean that our mental life is what determines the laws that govern logic. Uh, so there's a sort of reversal that it can occur there. Now in chapter 7, uh, Husserl will go on to discuss psychologism as a type of skeptical relativism, um, which is a very strong argument. But my video has already gone too far on. I've already gone on too far here. And I really just wanted to lay out some of Husserl's early discussions in the logical investigations uh, regarding what logic is and how his view is that logic is not grounded on psychologism. Um, and then he goes further to argue that, it's, uh, that, it, that it can be understood as a type of relativism and a sort of skepticism regarding logic. So psychologism is far and away Husserl's primary enemy within the early parts of the logical investigations. Of course, there's much, much more to the logical investigations because Husserl starts off by denying psychologism, but then he'll go on to argue in favor of a new way of understanding logic in an affirmative and in a positive sense. Now, what we're going to see eventually in the series of discussions here is we're going to talk about um, phenomenology <coughs> in the work of Martin Heidegger. And we'll see that uh, Martin Heidegger is going to employ sort of the affirmative conditions um, that Husserl sets out. Not so much in this text, but in the later text, the ideas text of going forward. Um, so anyway, this is the first sort of thing. And really what I want to do in this video is just give you a sense of what Husserl's discussion is regarding psychologism and what some of the reasons are he gives for why we ought to reject psychologism. Okay, um, that concludes our video for today regarding Husserl's logical investigations. Once again, this is Contemporary Philosophy. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you guys online. Bye.